May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Of all the stories Jesus told, the parable of the prodigal son is one of the best known and loved. Remember the younger son? He had kicked over the traces. He had demanded and been given the freedom to enjoy what was his. Me and my figured so prominently in his vocabulary, and now the money in his pocket seemed to lighten his step as he set off for the distant country. He would be master of his own fate. From now on, he would do things his way. And sure enough, we soon find him pandering totally to the increasingly demanding me and my, and living as if there was no tomorrow. But for him, tomorrow did come, and that all too soon. The resources that seemed so plentiful were gone. The God in which he had put so much faith had slipped through his fingers. It was gone. His newfound friends, with whom he had shared so generously, yes, they too were gone. The far country, which had seemed so full of provision, is now for him a land of famine. How tenuous his grasp of all that he had longed for was. And how lonely he now felt. No friends, no family, and not much of a future. For him the question now was not one of enjoyment, but of survival. That he had one more dice to play. If only he could get enough to live on, things might improve. He was in the far country, and for him salvation and survival would surely be found there. And so we find him selling his labor to a pig farmer. But what for? It's soon obvious that whatever agreement he had struck, the wages didn't even cover the basic necessity of enough food to ease the pangs of hunger. I'm starving to death, he says. Now let me remind you that there are lots of people on our city streets who can at least identify with this part of the story. Lots who, for whatever reason this morning, are in that same hopeless situation where they feel that no one cares, no one understands. But let me dare also to suggest to you that there are lots of people who have never slept rough in their lives, who have never felt the gnawing pangs of hunger and yet who can identify with the lost son in his condition. People for whom life has gone sour. People who have discovered for themselves that freedom to do my thing has led to bitterness of spirit. Oh yes, there may be millions in the bank or position in society, all the trappings of success. But what is it all for? What is it all about? Has it all been worthwhile? Lots of people who still become very uneasy when they hear the words of Jesus, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I believe that this story of the prodigal son speaks to all who suffer the crisis of identity and the entrapment of circumstances that this man now suffers. You see, sin is basically the result of selfishness, the deifying of the me and the mine. It has to do with our attitude, our response to God, and our attitude to others. And the sad truth about sin is that it pays poor wages. And however substantial its rewards may seem at the time, inbuilt corrosion soon brings 
inevitable decay. A common enough story then, as timeless as it is tragic. The story of the fall of man, writ large. The story of the folly of man, writ large. And in some measure, your story and my story. A common enough story. But let me say to you that this is one story that you cannot divorce from your storyteller. You see, Jesus related the tragic story of the lost son in order to reveal to us what sin and selfishness has done, to say to us, I know what you are going through. I'm aware of your pain and lostness, yes, even your fear. I'm not belittling the fact that much of what you now experience is the direct result of your earlier decisions. You chose the wrong path. Oh, yes, Jesus never belittles sin. He knows what it does more than anyone. But Jesus did not stop there. He was no impartial observer of the human scene. In very deed, it was this human scene that had brought him here. He too was the father's son and knew so well the father's heart and the father's hurt. And he wants to share that knowledge with us. But not yet. The focus is still on the lost son. In the midst of the degradation and despair, something is stirring. Thoughts of the past, the wholesome smells of food from the kitchen, the warmth of his bed, the sense of security. Yes, all began to come creeping back. How different it was. How much he had lost. But the danger now is that he has, having made his bed, to lie on it, or that is how it seems to him. And one of the tragic consequences of sin is that its ability to sap us of moral energy and rob us of hope mean that we feel ourselves at times beyond redemption. But that is a lie. I'm convinced a lie that the devil would have us believe. Let me tell you, that's not God's view. Or better still, let Jesus tell you, as he does so in the story. For now in the story, the young man comes to his senses. The insanity that took him to where he was and sought to keep him there is now beginning to go. He may not deserve forgiveness or a welcome from the Father, but he's willing to, suffer, to settle even for less. And so he will get up, go and ask. He came to his senses. His mind was changed. The Bible calls that repentance. The necessary first step on the ladder out of the pit of our own making. It's also the most difficult step. For it is one thing to know that we have made a mess of things, but another to admit it. Oh yes, it's difficult, but essential. And he takes that step as you and I have to. He came to his senses. That, however, is never enough. In the Bible, repentance is always allied to faith. Repent and believe the good news. The young man could not put things right with his father. He had wasted his substance, had nothing to offer, but he's going home. Has the father forgotten the son? No. A thousand times, no. Has he reservations about trusting him? No. Again, I say a thousand times, no. For this story is not just about a lost son, but every bit about a loving, waiting father. Not just a story of sin, but a story of grace and power. Jesus says, when the son was still a long way off, the father saw him. How long the father had been waiting for that moment. With what pain and longing had he yearned for that moment, when the insanity of selfishness would be dislodged. And now, as if to prevent the son's fears of rejection, he runs to meet him. I don't know what the son was thinking. He was practicing his prayer. Please, please. But before one word is uttered, the son is surrounded and smothered by love. 
The father throws his arms round him and kisses him. And that's the heart of the gospel. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us, for God is love. The love for the son has always been there. Once he abandoned the me and my and trusted in another, he finds the needs of me and my met at a deeper level than ever before. That was the experience of the lost son. That too was the experience of John Newton. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And Jesus placed that story in the context of joy, heavenly joy over a sinner repenting, joy at seeing one smiling again, singing, mourning as broken. Let us therefore this morning accept his invitation, receive his forgiveness, and become his children in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.